Hello. Hi. Hi, good evening. I'm Kay Gabriel. Um, welcome to the Poetry Project. Yeah, you can do that. That's great. Um, a reminder first, before we begin, um, please to keep your mask on if you are not one of the readers who's currently reading. Um, there's also um, a logistical reminder. Um, there is an accessible restroom uh, at the back on the left. Uh, there are two more uh, restrooms upstairs. Um, welcome. Um, oh, I had a, could someone bring me a copy of the newsletter? I really want to show it off, but I forgot it on my chair. Amazing, thank you. Um, thank you, Kyle. Um, it is so wonderful um, to be here tonight to celebrate um, 50 years of the Poetry Project newsletter. Wow. Um, it's really tremendous. It's a really tremendous milestone. It's very unlikely given um, the newsletter's um, origin. Um, and I'm not gonna take, our first um, uh, part of the evening um, is gonna be a panel talking about the newsletter. So I don't wanna take too much thunder away from, from that point. But I, 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 one thing that I want to, let's say, uh, start by acknowledging is um, uh, the only reason why it's lasted 50 years is because many, many people have edited it and uh, when it was mimeographed, have, um, have put it out on, you know, made the stencils for it and um, uh, 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 co um, collated it and um, put it in the post um, and wrote for it or wrote uh, excellent books that were reviewed in it. Um, and many of you are in the audience, which is really special. Um, so the fact that we have this um, very beautiful 50th anniversary issue with um, the cover art by Joe Brainerd. Um, yeah, it's really cool. Um, the only thing that makes this possible is, like with everything else at the project, is, is all of us. Um, all of us being who we are and um, being like a really critical part of this community. Uh, it's wonderful to, to um, share and celebrate uh, uh, this occasion with you all and to share this experience with you. Um, the way that this evening is gonna go, um, we are going to start with, um, uh, with a panel um, uh, that will be moderated by Nick Sturm um, and will feature um, current and former editors of the newsletter, um, uh, Betsy Fagan, uh, Greg Masters, uh, and Morgan Vo. Um, uh, then uh, Jillian McCain is going to um, introduce another former editor, um, uh, is going to introduce um, the next section. Jillian will talk for a while. Uh, uh, some of us will then read from some humorous or, or, or tense or interesting exchanges from the newsletter. Um, and those readers um, will be Kyle DeCoyan and me and Jeffrey Cyphers Wright and Penny Arcade. Um, and then um, Jordan Davis will close us out for the evening. Um, and I think that that's everything that I wanted. To, oh, um, I, I wanted to say before I do, uh, I, I should sort of acknowledge, well, you know, this is the 50th anniversary of the newsletter. Uh, how did it start? Um, it started in December 1972 when Ron Paget, uh, who I believe is watching on the live stream, so hello, Ron. Um, it's lovely to have you with us uh, in spirit, uh, or uh, really, like, kind of with us, just like at a distance. Um, uh, edited the first uh, 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 the, the the first issue, which really started as a three-page community news bulletin, and I think that the those a scan of those three pages are, I believe, on this pillar, if you want to go and read what the first issue of the newsletter was. Um, and then it developed over time. Eventually, people were like, well, why don't we start writing about poetry? And why don't we start writing reviews uh, or, or interviewing each other? Um, and, uh, uh, and, 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 and it snowballed from there. There have been 40 different editors. Um, uh, uh, it's uh, changed formats many times. Um, it's a really, really tremendous document. Um, and I'm excited that we're here to, to um, uh, uh, honor it tonight. Um, so I'm gonna bring up Morgan and the panel. And the panel, uh, sorry, I'm gonna bring up Nick and the panel, excuse me. Um, and if uh, Morgan, Betsy, and Greg also wanna come up and sit at the table, you'd be very welcome. Well, thank you.
Let's figure out what this sounds like. Does that sound all right? A little louder? Okay, let's pull it a little bit closer. Does that sound okay? Louder still? Yeah. Does this sound okay? Okay, that's a little bit better. Okay, great. Okay, thank you so much, Kay. Thank you, Kyle, and, and to the Poetry Project. It's incredible to, for me, as a person who studies the history of the Poetry Project, to be in this space talking about this document, as Kay said, with so many of the people who have helped um, create it over 50 years, um, which is highly unlikely. I'm here to tell you that 272, it's actually 272, not 270, two issues were numbered incorrectly. Um, <laughs> that <laughs> to make 272 issues of a poetry periodical is um, nuts. Um, I don't know another comparable example. Um, so I wanted to start with this quote from the poet Jim Brody, who is very much a part of the history of the Poetry Project. And he said this uh, to Bob Holman, I'm overjoyed at the project's history. And I think that's a really kind of weird sentence. <laughs> um, another way of phrasing Brody's sentiment is to say, I'm overjoyed at the fact, I'm overjoyed at the fact that a place such as the Poetry Project has continued to exist and so has a history, which is certainly how I feel as someone who studies and writes about the poets, periodicals, and writing communities that constitute that history. Um, but I also want to honor the statement's original Brody bentness. I'm overjoyed at the project's history. I want to begin um, first by reading these remarks and then open up in a opening up a conversation um, with the three editors, um, former and current. But first to play this brief audio segment um, this is from an interview conducted by Bob Holman with Bernadette Mayer and Lewis Warsh in 1978 in Lenox, Massachusetts. And what Holman was doing, funded by the CETA Artists Project, was to compile what became the oral history of the Poetry Project, completed but still unpublished, made from over 40 hours of original interviews with poets affiliated with St. Mark's. So at the beginning, you'll hear Bob Holman's voice, and then more faintly, Louis Warsh and Bernadette Mayer at the beginning of their first interview together. So ask a specific question. OK, well, uh, first reading that I have the Dieter who officially gave at the church, and I could be wrong because it's just trying to get, even get who read at the church at this point. You have to go through the voices and the East Village others. Are there announcements on file? Sort of. Yeah, not in the end, not from then. And after a while, they began the sending out of the weekly uh, flyers, which eventually led to the monthly calendars. And the newsletter, which started in seven, after the newsletter, in seven, which was uh, December 72. There was, I mean, things were, you don't lose anything after that. Right. Which is one yeah. thing that the, you, that's a real good point for the newsletter. It kept everything together, the info together. But before that, no, the files are, you would, uh, there's not much. When you think about that big metal file cabinet and all the information, there wasn't that well, it's much. a lot of years, too. Yeah. It's a lot of years. <laughs> it's 1966 that the uh, thing started. It's, it was a, September or October of 66 that the name of the Poetry Project. Uh, Bernadette's laugh and about the newsletter, Holman saying, you don't lose anything after that. And that's still the case. My experience of Holman's oral history and the other documentary projects he did for St. Mark's is a kind of magical thing because I'm watching a poet precede me in the same historical line of questioning a devotional lineage, maybe not unlike the lineage of editing the Poetry Project newsletter. And as he says, trying to figure out the history of the Poetry Project, it's a pretty basic set of questions. Who read here and when? Who taught workshops here? What really happened in this space? Um, and until the Poetry Project newsletter was started in 1972, six years after the founding of the Poetry Project, 
there's a kind of gap in those six years about what happened in this space. And the newsletter becomes the place where we no longer have questions about what happened in this space. Um, Ron Padgett, in the 50th anniversary issue, describes starting the newsletter, he considers it, quote, potentially useful but no big deal, <laughs> which is very much a Ron Padgett thing to say. Um, to me, the newsletter is such a big deal. Um, it's held the texture of the project's social fabrics. Um, it's an archive in itself. You don't lose anything after that. Um, the establishment of a newsletter at the project in 1972 wasn't coincidental. Um, within the larger um, landscape of alternative media at the time, the newsletter filled a gap in access to literary news created by the, de the decline of the underground press. Um, the first readings that were ever held at the project were publicized in the East Village Other, which in the mid to late 60s, along with John Wilcox, underground newspaper, Other Scenes, served as kindred publications to the early project. So here, for example, this is a advertisement in the East Village Other from September 1966. This is the first time that the Poetry Project, um, the name the Poetry Project ever appeared in print anywhere was in this advertisement with the picture of the church. Um, so with the underground newspapers shuttering in the early 70s due to political and economic blowback, and the new aesthetic communities forming in relation to the church, the newsletter emerged as this periodical of record. And now, 50 years later, the newsletter's complete run amounts to thousands of pages documenting the readings, performances, books and magazine publications, calls for work, political developments and upheavals, programmatic experiments, financial strains, aesthetic devotions and arguments, social contractions and expansions, anniversaries and milestones, births and deaths, reckonings, whims, disasters, and visions of the poets who animate one of the most innovative literary inst institutions of the 20th and 21st centuries. While every other publication has come and gone, the newsletter has remained the feisty bibliographic heart of the project's print culture. And considering all 272 issues together, the newsletter is the project's own living encyclopedia of itself, a colossal, gradually accumulating collaborative documentary effort that is the textual equivalent of its immense audio archive. Um, there were peer publications, uh, like the Bay Area's Poetry Flash, founded the same year as the newsletter, there was also the Beyond Baroque newsletter in Los Angeles. There was also American Poetry Archive News from San Francisco State University Poetry Center. There were institutional spin-offs at the Poetry Project. There was a newsletter called The Report, which appeared for six issues from 1979 to 1982, which documents the fundraising and reconstruction efforts following the fire that partially destroyed St. Mark's in July 1978. This is a photograph of this room after the fire in 1978 that appeared in the New York Times article. Um, that's Steve Facey standing in the ruins of this room. Um, and an incredible thing that happens in the report, for example, this newsletter published by the project, is that you find out that these, um, the organ pipes of the original um, organ that are above him on the second floor there, um, those were adopted by Louise Nevelson, who then used them in her sculptures. <laughs> so if you see any pipes that look like this in some Louise Nevelson, they came from here. Um, that's just an example of the kind of like vivid, unexpected details, social, aesthetic, institutional, uh, material histories that emerge from these untapped primary sources like the newsletter. Um, that all sounds kind of maybe nerdy, <laughs> uh, but they're also just really fun to read. Um, things that are fun to read in the newsletter, advertisements for wallpaper by Gordon Matta Clark, um, advertisements for learning to cook Italian food with Katie Schneeman. She's so sweet. A review by Bernadette Mayer of a Nathaniel Hawthorne biography that ends, 
I still don't know if Melville and Hawthorne had an affair. A review by C.N. Nye of Juliana Spar in 1997 Quote, Spar's response is a tense, incisive book which should reinstate confidence in poetry as a viable form of ideology critique. Michael Skolnick on the art of writing introductions to readings with a sample of recent introductions he'd written for events at St. Mark's. A note in Gillian McCain's Dirt column about Neil Young being in the audience at a Jeff Wright reading. Um, uh, in 1995, seeing a review by Lisa Jarnot of Robert Duncan's selected poems and then knowing that 20 years later she's publishing this incredible bi biography of Robert Duncan, you see a kind of lineage develop through the Poetry Project newsletter. And just an enormous amount of prose written by poets, nearly all of it uncollected, including reviews and essays by Eileen Miles, Chris Kraus, Alice Notley, Bill Berkson, Jim Brody, Lorenzo Thomas, Tom Clark, Patricia Spears-Jones, Charles North, Ansem Hollow, Leslie Scalpino, and so many others. All right, just an incredible resource. Um, and the three editors that we have here today, um, Betsy Fagan was the editor of eight issues from October, November 2015 to April, May 2017. Um, Morgan Vo, editor of four issues ongoing from 267 to the present. And then Greg Masters, who holds the title of being the longest running editor of the Poetry Project newsletter. Um, Greg edited 24 issues from September 1980 to May 1983. Okay. Um, so I want to open it up with a, just a broad general question. We can approach this any way we want, but how did you all become editors of the Poetry Project newsletter? Well, I was around at every reading pretty much in those early days, and Ron Padgett, who was director at the time, just took notice and appreciated the volunteering. and. Uh, I had been editing, co-editing a poetry magazine featuring most of the poets who were in this neighborhood at the time. So I think I was, and I, and I had uh, raised concerns about my predecessor's newsletters. So I, I kind of put my hat in the ring and, and Ron offered me the gig and I was glad he did. I will go down the line. Um, I, I was sort of volunteered to do it. There are a lot of editors in this room right now. I just want to note that I noted your presence <laughs> in the audience. Um, I was volunteered, sort of. It's, it's a, I don't know how it was for you, but it's a, it's, it was described to me as the opportunity to wear a lead cape. And that's what it was for me. Uh, yeah, it wasn't uh, posed to me as a detrimental uh, <laughs> um, situation. I, I uh, started writing poetry at the project, um, and from the very first, it was uh, clear that part of the history of people who wrote poetry here uh, was that they participated as editors and organizers of magazines and of the newsletter. Um, so it always seemed to me like a kind of coveted space to be in. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to remember, maybe it was like really early, either late 2019, early 2020, Kyle asked me to do a review. Um, and slowly from there, uh, I just felt like the door was kind of open um, and just kept asking to do more things with it. Uh, so uh, I similarly had kind of asked uh, to be a part of it. Mm -hmm. And I'd also like to clarify that at, at the moment, um, we run as an editorial collective. So uh, Bianca Messenger, who's in here with us, can't see you, Bianca, but, and Kay, too. Um, we all work on the... Uh, newsletter together, and I've also uh, been here as uh, Imani Elizabeth Jackson and John Rufo um, have also participated. So. Mm -hmm. Do you all get paid? 
Do you get paid? I can't remember. I was, um, I was an administrative assistant in the office, so I got paid for that. I'm not sure if I got paid for the newsletter. I can't remember. <laughs> There, there was a, a nominal contribution. It was sort of symbolic. <laughs> <laughs> I think, yeah, I, I get paid. Um, I would say it's less symbolic. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of, if, if you've um, been a part of the community around the Poetry Project um, for even more than the last 20 years, some of you have been part of it for the entire, I mean, Bill McKay, for example, is here tonight, who is the, edit, the second editor of the Poetry Project newsletter. You, you know if you've had the copies of the newsletter in your hands that it's changed formats and styles so many times over the years. Po poems weren't included in the newsletter until the eighth issue. Um, uh, interviews, not until 25, I think, reviews and interviews. So the newsletter has changed a lot. And uh, I was curious about how the newsletter changed maybe the most under your editorship or what kind of things you, kind of choices you made. And I know Greg, for example, like the choice that you made was to change the printing of the newsletter from mimeograph to offset, which was a huge change in the, in the print culture of the Poetry Project. Yeah. Um. I had to argue, I, uh, I had to make my case before the board to convince them. It was, it was you know, kind of avant-garde to go from Mimeo to the real world possibilities of uh, offset. But I'd been doing it monthly, I might say, for two years as Mimeo, which was a tremendous amount of work. I never minded, but it was, you know, typing, running off the stencils, collating, and I thought this would be uh, just speed things up a bit and look better and it allowed me to put art in there and business cards a little I thought I'd attract some revenue um, did you yeah mo they're mostly freebies like the source which is still advertising because he <laughs> Santo because he was doing you know giving us breaks on copying and stuff. So, you know, it was like bartering. Uh, I had Katie's business card in there just because I loved Katie and George, so throw that in there. But the biggest ad I got was from William Morrow when I, I happened to review a book, Chuck Wachtell book, and they bought an ad. I remember it was $100 I charged them. And that was like tremendous. It was a full page ad. So that, you know, it was like a step up from our <laughs> Mimeo opportunities. Where was the, where was the Gestetner mimeograph in the church? In the office. Mm -hmm. I think maybe sometimes we took it out to the balcony. Just could, right here. Could hardly remember. Yeah, because it was noisy and people were working in the office. And it was just running all day and night. <laughs> but uh, I should say, I, w I was a able to do that because I was friends with poet Barbara Barg, who had a who had a typesetting business with her partner Joel Chasler, and she taught me how to use the CompuGraphic 7500, which was a precursor to desktop publishing. This is 1982, you would know better. <laughs> And so I learned, and she allowed me, after hours, to go to her loft, and like midnight, and from midnight to two or three in the morning, I'd be there typesetting. And um, so, yeah, that enabled me to do that. Um, for me, I think some of the things you mentioned about that staying up until two or three in the morning um, I think a lot of people are familiar with that. That was a big part of the job. And especially by the time I got it, you, you mentioned changing the structure. I didn't, I, I didn't actually dub Sarah Jane the reviews editor, but that, she got the title in print under my reign. Yeah. Can you hear me? 
Okay. I was just saying it's a big, big job. It's always been a big job, and part of what makes it work is when it's collaborative, right, and having people to help. So it wasn't so much that I had an editorial vision that expanded and included a reviews editor. I couldn't get it done by myself. And I certainly tried and recognized that it was beyond my capacity and that I needed help. So I asked for help. And I had a couple people. I knew nothing about layout. I didn't have the mimeograph to deal with, but I still, I'm not a graphic designer. Oh. I didn't know how to lay out the software, but I asked for help and people were generous and helped. Um, and reviews came in. From my perspective, um, and what I hoped to do with the newsletter was to continue to have it be a collaborative community effort rather than something which uh, in my time here <laughs> has often happened. There are different cliques. This is, this is a community of people, right, with all their personalities and challenges and gifts. And sometimes things break into cliques and groups and an in-crowd and an out-crowd. And I was interested in sort of pushing the boundaries on that and spreading out the work so it wasn't just all falling on one person. I think a lot of the editors would also agree with me that they had a lot of sleepless nights and a lot of stress involved in generating this product for the community. And then you put it out there and you hear nothing, right? So it's wonderful to have this, but I was like, what, you know, where were you in 2016 when I was up all night? You know, you don't know what happens, you know, if the work reaches anyone, if anybody's reading it, if it just gets thrown out. So my name is Betsy, Betsy Fagan. Yeah, um, so I'm thrilled that it became a collaborative effort. Um, that's, I think that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. can, can I just add before yeah. Morgan, that I agree with Betsy. I never got a letter to the editor. I'd never heard a word from anybody in the years I've done. So this event tonight is really appreciated to you know, get some acknowledgement. <laughs> Um, what was I going to say? The, so the two major formal shifts in structure and in format uh, happened, you know, in the like years preceding, uh, just preceding uh, my joining the editorship or the, the collective. Uh, one was the formation of the editorial collective, which, as you're saying, like I, I can only imagine that it was kind of that way in an informal way prior to um, Kyle and the team making it more tangible. Um, the other was the move to the tabloid newsprint version, um, which I think really doesn't you know, shift a whole lot. There's not some like, major point of execution mm -hmm. um, that, that signifies. Uh, what it does kind of allow is that since we have an editorial collective and since it, it's not always the case that we have a huge amount of work, but sometimes we will have, I mean, this uh, latest issue is quite large, um, and we can add as many pages as we want, and it doesn't really shift the, uh, the cost, mm -hmm. um, and it also doesn't really shift, like, you know, we don't have to move tons of things around mm -hmm. in order to make that happen. Um, so just in terms of formal shifts, uh, that's what comes to mind. Um, but yeah, just a second, what you're saying, I mean, even beyond the three to four members of the editorial collective that are ever working on an issue, the entire staff is involved. The entire staff uh, has definitely taken the opportunity to act as editors. Mm -hmm. um, there's tons of people proofreading. Uh, it, it really just does exp even if we had like five or six or seven or eight editors in the editorial collective, I kind of can't imagine it getting done without another, you know, six or so hands in it, even as we're doing it digitally and everything. So, yeah. 
Right. And that makes me think about how easy it is to, to enter the history of the Poetry Project through the newsletter if you choose to. To publish a review in the newsletter is so easy like to approach. Um, and then you get to be a person who's published in the same place as Edwin Demby and Amiri Baraka and Alice Notley. And that's, that's a rare space to have. Um, I've been asking every editor that I've met tonight how editing the newsletter changed your relationship to the Poetry Project. Uh, and one thing that a lot of people have said actually is about when people have died who have been a, a part of the community around the Poetry Project. And maybe that could be something that we talk about, but not the only thing. But how has it changed your relationship to the Poetry Project? No, you go first. <laughs> 24 issues, great, well, you did it. Yeah. Um, well, I'll just say it gave me tiny power and audacity to go after stuff that I wanted, you know, go after the heroes like, like Ted Berrigan and Allen Ginsberg and Creeley and James Schuyler and Andre Kudrescu, who's here, and, um, and I could get art from big names like Alex Katz and Yvonne Jaquette and George Schneeman. But primarily, I was trying to promote a younger crowd of poets who were based here and living primarily in the East Village. Uh, and so the newsletter was, you know, a community newsletter. It was, it was trying to establish an identity of these, this new crop of young poets in this neighborhood in the mid, late 70s, early 80s. We're going down the line. All right. Um, you want me to yeah, you got, some, you got something to say? I'm, I'm thinking about it. If you have uh, something, okay. um, I mean, for me, I would, I would say that, well, it's also only been four issues, so what, the tune of like a year. Um, but it has absolutely like deepened my sense of camaraderie here, which was already deep. I would say that you know, there's no other institution in the city other than maybe the Park Slope Food Co-op uh, where, like, I am actually a member and volunteering my time and getting so much out of it. Um, the one thing that I, I maybe, um, I do think that this document is a history of the project, but I think it's probably better understood as a, you know, in its full scale, mm -hmm. as a history of the newsletter, only because it's been my experience in the short time that I've been working on the newsletter that uh, there's lots of opportunities for people who I maybe wouldn't think of as part of our community to be in the newsletter. Um, there's a kind of ease to that entry, and there's also, to my mind, as, or I, as a member of the community, um, a desire to bring in as much poetry as possible, which necessarily extends outside of, you know, the social proximity of this place. Um, so I think, I do feel that for me right now, there's kind of an exciting opportunity to play that kind of uh, organizational role in terms of inviting people who I know to be part of the broader poetry community um, into, into this space in that way. Yeah, I, I want to echo things that you've both said, and I think it's a tension that's run through. I spoke with a few other editors that it's, it's moved through time, this tension between um, honoring and supporting the physical local community here in this space and then also broadening out to the larger poetry world, right? Um, the thing I wanted to say about how it's changed things for me is I, I was always one of those people who did not feel like they belonged at the Poetry Project mm. from jump and I've been coming here since the 90s. So that's something about me right, because I come back all the time. But um, there's, 
trying to think of the best way to say this. Their ideas about what community is and then their lived experiences of being within a community that can be very different. So I think for me, it was, I became more a part of this community and this space because I could connect to poetry in a larger, broader kind of scope, if that makes sense to people. Like maybe I had beef with people here at the project, maybe there were people I was trying to avoid and people talking shit about me, but I could talk to poets in LA and I could talk to poets in England and I could talk to poets in other places in the world and recognize that we're all in this sort of lineage or community together, whether we like each other or not. <laughs> Nick, can I just add one more tactical issue? Uh, I was fortunate, uh, Bernadette Mayer was director and Bob Holman was assistant when I was editor. And they allowed me to do whatever I wanted. I had no restrictions if I wanted to make the newsletter bigger. It was never an issue. So I just wanted to thank them 40 years later um, for that support. Though I never got a thank you. They never said good job or anything oh God, like, yeah. like everybody else, but they allowed um, me to keep the job the next year and the year after, so I guess I was doing all right. What, um... Yeah. <laughs> um just a, a, final, a final statement about the newsletter, what Betsy's saying about the, like, the regional reach of the newsletter. When there's a regional update section first added to the newsletter in the late 90s, one of the regions is the internet, which is like just incredible as like a, a record of how the literary landscape has changed. Um, thank, I was gonna ask you all about gossip, but we can talk about that later. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Morgan, Betsy, and Greg for your editorship and for talking with us all tonight. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, um, Nick, Morgan, Betsy, and Craig. Um, uh, next, please welcome uh, Jillian McCain. Hi. In uh, 1993, Jordan Davis asked me if I would write a gossip column for the newsletter, and I gladly accepted. Looking back at old issues recently, I think I was consciously or unconsciously inspired by the Bill McKay era Poetry Project newsletters from 1973-74, which were filled with news about upcoming events, literary magazines, book releases, and gossip. And I think Bill is here, or I saw him. Did he leave? Yay! Hi! <laughs> <laughs> so nice to see you. Um, here are some excerpts from his tenure. Quote, Michael Brownstein has completed a 310-page novel equidistant between pornographic and the pastoral. Quote, John Asbury just got a job at Brooklyn College but is taking a year's leave of absence. That's moxie. Paris Review, the story so far. George Plimpton plays touch football, reads his magazine. The candy cotton hits the fan. Maxine Grofsky resigns. The Paris office closes. Tom Clark receives a letter, becomes an advisor, advisory editor. Meanwhile, our hero, the Paris Review, eludes U-boats, crosses the Atlantic, and sets up in Manhattan. Michael Benedict is named poetry editor. Stay tuned. <laughs> and quote, as if we didn't know already, Ann Waldman was tabbed one of the world's sexiest women in the July 11th Women's Wear Daily. In another issue, he mentions Ann again. A Scottish newspaper account of Ann Waldman's visit to the UK alludes to her Bowery accent. Anne claims it was strep throat. 
In the same issue, Bill writes, the December issue of the newsletter carried a birth announcement that was, at best, offensive. To the parents in question, Aram and Galen Saroyan, I offer my sincere, overdue apologies. The only mention of Aaron Saroyan in the December issue was the following, quote, Aram Saroyan tells how he kicked pot and why in a New York Times op-ed, November 23rd. <laughs> in October 1974, another birth announcement. Latest addition to our humble planet Earth is eight pound, eight pound ounce, Edmund Joseph Berrigan. <laughs> Alice is fine, I am a lunatic, says Ted. Bill also gives shutouts on behalf of those looking for work. Quote, poet Bob Rosenthal cleans house, makes anything immaculate, available for hire, call 477-2487. And back to the December issue, quote, for those who missed Richard Goldstein's Why We Need the New York School, Village Voice, November 14th, it populates a poetry jungle with bohemian macho men. Academic cowboys, quote, gnawing and clawing after prestige in the most ethereal hierarchy outside the Vatican, unquote. Poor Richard, where do you live? Here, it's a lot less bizarre, but kinder. P.S., we did enjoy Gerard's pictures. Bill is referring to poet and photographer Gerard Malunga, who 20 years later I mentioned in my column, Dirt. Quote, speaking of Gerard Malunga, did anyone read his letter to the editor published in the New York Times Arts and Leisure section in early February? Reading, reading an article about Sharon Stone wearing a see-through top to a breakfast meeting seems to have really upset him, unquote. In the same column I wrote, who and when is someone going to reissue Bob Rosenthal's masterpiece, Cleaning Up New York? <laughs> Fact story. Thanks to the newsletter and, and Bill, uh, Bill Mackey, uh, Bob got actual gigs as a house cleaner and utilized the experience as inspiration for his brilliant book, Cleaning Up New York which was published by Ann Waldman and Lewis Warsh's Angel Hair Books in 1976. In 1993, at the time I wrote this column, it had not been reissued. I'm happy to report that the New York Review of Books reprinted it in 2016. See, the power of the newsletter to affect future events is eternal. <laughs> Speaking of the late Lewis Warsh, in 1993, I wrote in Dirt, quote, Lewis Warsh told us that a bookstore in Mississippi requested a copy of George Tisch's Acola Lea, published by Lewis's United Artists, pronto, because someone needs it to be used for a special ed class. Lewis has reservations about sending it, with poem titles like Deconstructing Sodomy, Genitalia, and Enema, he just doesn't think they'd be getting exactly what they bargained for. And I'm not sure Alice Quinn, poetry editor of The New Yorker, bargained for the scene I described in my February-March 1994 column. Quote, how can I begin a dirt column without first mentioning the antics of Sparrow? Seconds after giving me his latest issue of Big Fish, filled with translations from The New Yorker, he told me of the previous day's follies. Sparrow, along with his poet wife Ellen Carter, and I'm sure daughter Sylvia was there somewhere, Ron Colm and others stormed the offices of Tina Brown's empire for a sit-in, protest, love-in, dialogue opener to invite a discourse with the New Yorker's poetry editor, Alice Quinn, on why she seemed so bent on publishing poems about Greek gods, bird baths, and Connecticut angst. <laughs> Of course, the sun-dried, tomatoey red tape was just too much to get through, with a worried-looking receptionist calling in a jack-of-all-trades guy, probably an intern from the Iowa writing program, to buffer the situation, telling the protesters that it's really better to call. 
As the protest went on, an anonymous poet repeatedly faxed to the magazine's offices a letter stating, the question, why is there New Yorker poetry, is as vexing as a theological question, why is there evil in the world? <laughs> Ron Coleman, author of the brilliant chapbook, Welcome to the Barbecue, described the event as a, quote, data event to kill off daddy, unquote. Sparrow, t Sparrow told a reporter, personally, I think our poets are just as bad as their poets, but at least we have a sense of humor. We demand to get published in The New Yorker because we're just as bad as they are. Right on. <laughs> um, I continued to dig up Poetry Project Dirt for two years. I love doing it. Uh, the full run of the column should be available, if not now, then eventually in the Poetry Project's archives at the Library of Congress. And our next readers are Kyle De DeCoyan, Kay Gabriel, Jeffrey Cyphers Wright, and Penny Arcade. Thank you. Um, this is the sort of like arena section of the evening where we're reading uh, heated, intense, beautiful, fun, surprising exchanges between folks. But <clears throat> if I can be f sincere for a moment before that, I do want to just say it's incredibly touching to be in a room with so many editors. Um, we so deeply appreciate the work that you've done and it means a lot to us that you're here and yeah. Um, and I particularly want to thank our maestro, Kay Gabriel, for organizing this with... <laughs> I think Kay's, uh, the way Kay has assembled this event is just with so much genuine affection and study and adoration, so thank you. Um, I'm going to read a letter from Aram Saroyan, uh, and then an anonymous response that was published in the newsletter. And um, if someone is the writer of this anonymous response, I would love to be the recipient of that gossip. A letter to the New York School, Point Arena, California, March 15th, 1974. Dear friends, I am writing this from the remote distance of Point Arena, California, and in a way the geography speaks for itself. If I was once among you, and I sometimes wonder if I ever really was, I no longer am, and it is out of a confusion of impulses toward you, individually and en masse, that I write you now. In the past several years, I've gone through the changes of marriage, fatherhood, and moving out of the city. And in the process, I have not only lost touch with many of you as friends, but I have also undergone a change in relation to the work you have done and continue to do, as represented in many of the periodicals, which I receive as token, I guess, of our association. What I have to say is simple, but I think it is true. I feel that the work that is being done right now by many of you who are my contemporaries is of a high quality in almost every dimension but one. Perhaps two. At least two words come to mind, but perhaps the two words are one. The two words I am thinking of are honesty and sincerity. It seems to me that these are the two qualities most subject to abuse in the work of the New York School. I realize immediately, of course, that my very mention of these two words constitutes an abuse of the aesthetic with which you have now so completely identified yourselves, but I do so without really fearing the risk involved. To be considered a crackpot or a cornball by the New York School would only place me with the mass of humankind in the eye of its aesthetic, and I don't mind the association at all. I only hope I'm truly worthy of it. At the age of 30, this whole question of uniqueness becomes a little absurd. If one is alive at this age, 
one is almost inescapably among one's brothers and sisters, and he's underlining different words here, among one's brothers and sisters, dependent on them for help in one form or another in simply getting through. The point is the work I am referring to was simply not written for humankind. It is like a machine constructed with absolutely no purpose in mind for it and immediately released on the world at large as if it were the gift of the ages, all rewards in itself, etc. The periodicals are bounding into the mailboxes one after another and there now seem to be at least three distinguishable generations at work my own contemporary is the middle one, and yet I find it harder and harder to see the point of it all. Even here in this remote location, in the midst of trying to work out the purchase of some land for us to live on, we are now a family of four, I received one periodical and one book in the mail today, and even before I looked through them, I knew I was the recipient of yet another exercise in utter irrelevance. As one who once considered himself in the vanguard of writing as writing, it is difficult for me to describe my feelings when confronted by a new generation of writers who are dedicated not to an exploration of any particular literary dimension I can identify beyond a snotty tone of voice. I know this is not something I myself ever had in mind. Beyond that, there are a number of other identifiable trends which I would characterize briefly as one, poems that prove how smart I am, two, poems that prove what a master of rhetoric I am, three, poems that prove I am a dope addict, and four, poems that just generally prove how hard I am to understand in any way. These are the substance of most of the periodicals I receive in the mail, and at this stage of my life, it is an act of total selflessness for me to even riffle their pages, so offensive are they to my own effort and my own dream. I am a writer because I desire to communicate with my fellow man and woman and child, and writing is one avenue open to me to do this. As I experience more of life, my own respect for it grows, and it is impossible for me to regard it and anyone else within it as the subject or object of any kind of literary exercise. It is an experience that is bigger and more profound than any telling turn of phase, phrase or immaculate run-on sentence. It is quite simply real, not brilliant, not arcane, not sarcastic, but alive. And in just being alive, more meaning than we could ever hope to fathom. The most we could hope for, I believe, is an honest and sincere and uncomplicated accounting of our own individual experiences as members of this miracle of being alive in time. I don't wish to speak for anyone here but myself, although it seems to me that much of what I have learned has been the knowledge of others before me and contemporary with me. As a writer today, my goal is simple. I want to keep myself in the best physical shape I can, <laughs> to develop my stamina in writing so that I can make the most of whatever small talent I possess to tell the truth of my life as long as I live it, just as it pleases me to give a gift to someone of anything I have made or done in sincerity, I believe it pleases life itself to live it as long and as hard and as humbly as one can. I am sending this to you in care of Bill McKay's Poetry Project newsletter of St. Mark's Church in New York perhaps the single outlet that will reach the greatest cross-section of you in the hopes that it will be printed. I wish you all health and happiness, and I say goodbye to you, at least for a while. Love, Aram, Soroyan. It's in parentheses. And now uh, an anonymously written response. A few weeks ago, the newsletter received the following communique. An open letter to the Howdy Doody School of Poetry from the New York School. 
Dear Aram Saroyan, your letter to me was real nice. Did you know it had the following underlined words? Honesty, sincerity, among, the, as writing, tone of voice, real, alive, honest, sincere, uncomplicated, question mark, love, signature, the New York School. And I think the next reader is Kay. Thank you, Kyle. Um, I'm glad that someone mentioned Barbara Barg. Um, I'm going to be reading an interview that uh, Vicki Hudspeth uh, conducted with Barbara Barg um, in uh, 1978. I'm going to be reading both the questions and the answers. The answers are a lot longer. Um, but when I say Q, it's Vicki Hudspeth. When I say A, it's Barbara Barg. Uh, interview with Barbara Barg, who has been published in every magazine she ever worked on. A raven-haired beauty this week. She lives in New York City. Uh, question, how has tuberculosis, apparently she did actually get it, how has tuberculosis affected your writing? Answer, I become a romantic poet. Q, as a result, can you use one word for many? A, yes, and I find myself doing that a lot lately. I feel it's like, you know, part of my growth process. For example, the other day I was walking up 6th Avenue and the weather was great, very sunny and not much chill. I was walking along and singing a little tune to myself, had a little skip in my boot heels and just generally felt totally tolerable. When this guy standing among the palm trees, he was on the sidewalk in front of one of those plant stores, says, hey, pitless bitch, got a smoke? So I look at the guy and I really feel like saying something back to the creep like, you should lose all your teeth except one, and that one should have such an abscess, or, or something really devastating like, hope your dick falls off in your father's mouth. But then I noticed that to say such a thing to this guy would be a total mistake, because the guy is obviously psychotic, the kind the post would love to put on the front page, and I've always felt it's only wise to answer to those kind of creeps with a grenade, you know. So I looked at him very coolly, but firmly. I mean, I wasn't weak or anything. I looked at him right in the eye, and I said, Question, do you really understand what you read? Answer, I'm not sure I can condone an activity like understanding what you read, that is, trying to m understand or make sense of what someone else has written, may well be an invasion of privacy. What, for example, would be the difference between how I understand something today and how I understand the same thing at the close of the most interesting day of my life? How beautiful it is. Look, there it is now. Give me liberty or give me death. Why didn't you answer my calls? Question, would you call yourself a word detective? Answer, the treasures of a serious text are said to be hidden by those who are wise in their own estimation, who are puffed up by the teaching of vain philosophy. The beauty and power and mystery of the plan are not perceived. The word, is, the word is, is to be our study then. It's an inexhaustible treasure, but we fail to find this treasure because we do not search until it's in our possession. Often we take the sayings of others for truths, being too indolent to put ourselves to diligent, earnest labor. We invent understandings, but our inventions are not only unreliable, they're dangerous, for they place a word where a person would be. So what you're actually left with is a missing person. It gets to be pretty sleazy, this detective stuff. <laughs> Question, that sounded vaguely religious. Can you use words? Answer, I must use words. If I don't use words, then they use me. Question, are you ready for a review? Answer, why, you got one? Question, I understand you have a typesetting business. Answer, oh yes, it's been around since 1980. It's terrific and gives special rates to writers and other creative types. We're located at 156 West 27th Street, Suite 5, New York City, or phone us at 212-675-0914. We're the best in the business. Thank you. And the next reader is Jeffrey Cyphers Wright. Barbara Barg. 
What a genius. I was lucky enough to publish her, Obey the Chemicals. So, Kay, thank you so much again for choosing me. You, you saw some of my things in the old issues, and you said you really loved reading the reviews I wrote. You said, they're sharp, pointed, exciting to read, such a model for poetry criticism. So <laughs> thank you so much for choosing here. Kay chose a piece by Eileen Miles for me to read, which ostensibly was a review of Cliff Feynman and Lenny Goldstein. Um, the three-page piece isn't really a review. It's a satiric creed de cour disparaging mimeo in favor of real books. And the title is Mimeo Opus. But doing the Mimeo thing was uh, nevertheless a badge of honor for us. We championed that independence and we upheld the traditions of Mimeo proudly. And the Poetry Project was a model for that and 50 years later it still is a model. It's a testament to the vital tradition of promoting exciting, durable work that goes on here. Um, so the first reading I came to at St. Mark's was in 1976 in this room with Charles Bukowski. And the, the original pews were still here. Were you there, Patricia? All right. <laughs> you remember Charles came up with a six pack of tall boys, put them on the table, sat down, started reading. And uh, we realized after the first three that the reading would be over <laughs> when all six drinks were gone, right? So, um, uh, the first poem I published in the newsletter references Bukowski and it's called Back to Back. And Back to Back could be a name for tonight's celebration because we're going back to the beginning and recognizing the continuity, the living thread that runs through this place of the people who pick up the torch and further explore the cave. And because the people who carry on this tradition are back to back with their forebears bearing the legacy. Um, Francis Lefevre, Ann Waldman's mother, published Back to Back in the newsletter. And uh, she was formidable, but friendly. And after going to her Christmas party one year, I figured that the easiest way to get published was to write a review. And it worked. And reviewing became a habit I still indulge in. And I liked getting published, and I also liked getting free books since I was pretty broke in 78. And uh, St. Mark's became my second home here. Um, Chris Krauss one time wrote about these Mimeo mags in Summer of Hate. My name was Seth Morgan, and everybody would hang out at my house, and we would all publish these mags that she said no one read. But we did, you know, we did read them. And uh, in this first workshop I went to, Ted had told us all to start a Mimeo magazine and thus begin my hookup to the lineage. And uh, since there were already a few mags, I started the Hard Press Poetry postcard series instead. <laughs> Thank you. A lot of people I published, 80 or so. And uh, everyone was doing Mimeo, including Eileen. And I'm going to read a sample of her Mimeo opus, um, which Kay told me was later followed up by Bernadette Mayer's defense of Mimeo in the following issue. So forgive me if I stumble a little bit because I didn't realize this is on the original, it came out kind of like pinkish from the original yellowy pages, right? But this is Mimeo Opus um, and it starts off, I've never liked Mimeo. Sure, it's fast and it's cheap, but it doesn't look like a book. If you can do it yourself, why bother? Why not just Xerox your favorite new poems from time to time and hand them to your friends? Or better still, why not stylishly fold your latest into your back pocket and show it to the several people who matter? How many people's taste do you trust? I mean, who actually understands poetry? I publish my poems in Mimeo magazines. I like to see them breathe beyond my own typewriter though I'm much happier when they're typeset. And I have one, no, two Mimeo books in print. There were 165 copies done of the first one. I've got one copy, and there are 164 out in the world. Maybe you've got one. Maybe I do. And damn, isn't that a nice thing to have now, a Mimeo book by Eileen Miles, right? 
<laughs> I'm too pensive in here. So she goes on, and she mentions uh, Lenny, and she mentions uh, Cliff a little bit, and she comes to this uh, conclusion. She's going, so what's the argument? She says that Mimeo readers would just put their stuff together faster, but if you had a real book, you'd work on it harder. That's the gist of it. So she says, so what's the argument? One guy doesn't give a damn about what he wrote Beth last year, and the other has great reverence, would probably have even more, and might have selected differently if more money was involved in the undertaking. I still don't like Mimeo books. All books should be bright and shiny and look like books. Yeah, and pigs should have wings, Eileen. But when I hear books, any books shouldn't exist, that economics so influence thought that some younger, older, any poet should shut up and wait, well, wait for that more expensively produced books. Maybe they would make poets think harder. Oof! Poets should think easier, of course. What is this, the Middle Ages? It all sounds terribly like the test of time. Whose time? Your time? My time? What time? Oh, I get it. Like the test of time. Like I don't know if I believe a word of anything I just said, or if there was ever a question of that. Let it rip. And I wanted to um, just finish with this poem that I mentioned back to back from 1978, and to say that I've always been extremely honored and proud of my association with the Poetry Project here, and it's, it's very nice to be asked. Thank you again. This poem's called Back to Back Sonnet. The days run off like water saddles on wasted horses working for peanuts. I look for the flower of youth under the chestnut canopy at St. Mark's Church, accompanied by laser guitar beam drive. My friends stand at the mouth of Tunnel City, inviting backwards light to linger on a puff of reefer smoke spiraling thoughtlessly into an anonymous snowfall. We kiss and curse ragged lips in tunnel vision, expiring every available incident with ravenous and exhausting bloodthirst making it hold water, another way to leak, chronic glory, and a guest pass to the dust. Thank you so much. Thank you, appreciate it. And now, if I could introduce my good friend, the one and only genius, Penny Arcade. Come on up here, Penny. Well, what a wonderful event. You know, I'm a big believer in synchronicity. By the time you're in your 70s, if your life is not synchronistic, something wrong. So it's interesting that I've gotten this particular thing to read. Um, well, one, because it's Bernadette Mayer, uh, and of course she's just left the planet, and she was such a great genius and so important, uh, so influential. But the other thing is because what she's saying in here is so me, you know, so inutterably me. Um, I sort of thought about whether I was going to explain that, but I've decided not to. Mimeo argument, Bernadette Mayer. I've always liked Mimeo. If I had the time and money to do it, I'd publish my complete works and the completed works of other poets in plain, finite, mimeographed editions for distribution to probably no more than 400 people. Nor would this be a bad thing to do. In fact, it would be pretty cool. 
I don't like the preciousness of poems on a page. Better to blend them in to a long series of a, or a longer work. Better to superimpose them. Better to keep them forever in your back pocket. Although everyone takes pleasure in a beautiful object, even a stone, the accident of what poetry is good in what consequent wrappings, the complete works of Bernadette Mayer, $3,000, coffee stains on wrappers, seems both unaccountable and fascinating. I hate the precious book buying business, except in the ways that it can help to support poets. To prefer glossiness to modesty for its own sake is a step in the direction of condemning is in the direction of condemning plagiarism and its friends' obscenity and political freedom. With the proliferation, maybe now easing, of books produced through government grants comes direction from the governments that they will, will not fund mimeograph things. Apparently, as far as you can see, the government prefers the glossy and the bound and bookstores seem to deteriorate as rapidly as the remaining mimeograph things in them. Nowadays, it's not strange for small press publishers to accept a poet's manuscript and take four years to produce it. Even a magazine will occasionally do that. The forthcoming issue of Cold Springs Journal has been forthcoming for seven years. The cheaper and slightly more instantaneous reproduction of poetry for those who can use it is not a bourgeois value. The craving for a book with a binding is. The people who actually understand poetry are at the very least the ones who are served by the darling mimeograph. If the mimeographers have the energy, lasting precious books are one thing and that's for the jobbers. Disseminating poetry in a particular decade is pretty ephemeral. Nor do I mean to agree with Eileen that a poet won't put her best works in a mimeograph form, because the very freedom from restrictions and forms of abuse of the author permits a more limitless devotion. I like books in all forms, but I think it is strictly New Grub Street to advocate the theory in relation to poetry that money makes money. There ain't, no, there ain't any real money. There never was, my dear fame. Without a doubt, the better looking book will rightfully aggrandize the poet, but the fancy book never done nothing for the blank poem. The newsletter, parentheses, isn't ratty in its present form, but suits the need to write to a larger audience about events that aren't planned a year and a half in advance. And you wouldn't like it if they were. As luck will have it, America in the fashion toot binding and lamination right now, Mimeograph has a traditional reputation for being for beatniks and desperate Russian writers. But this monetary, uh, but this momentary and urgent dissemination of poetry, which is also full of pleasure, is not the marketplace, but a kind of cup bearing for the knowledge and pleasure of poetry. I believe that since the Industrial Revolution, Western questions of values are sardonic, if not sarcastic, and that my only resource as a poet in 1982 is to put myself on the side of things which exist at an angle slightly askew to any desire for fame or even value for the works. Forget about value as it's perceived and take as much pleasure in my life as a poet as desire can construe and hurry to change the world in small performance as others like John Cage have done since you can't stop fucking writing anyways. Thank you. Thank you, Penny. And our final reader of the night is Jordan Davis. Uh, please welcome.
It's crazy that you all are here to celebrate a, a typed newsletter. That's so beautiful, so arbitrary. Um, I was sitting next to Jillian at Jeff, Jeff's reading with Rick Ocasek and these two really scraggly guys who looked like they never heard of hair conditioner sat down in front of us. And I said, Jillian, isn't that a Canadian folk hero in front of us? <laughs> and it, it was Neil Young. And he leaned over to the, the roadie or producer, whoever was with him, and a guitarist or legendary songwriter, I don't, I don't know, and said, I don't know what Rick's doing with this poetry shit. It was, it was a pretty good reading. Um, I, I I got the job working at the newsletter because I was dating someone who had a work study grant from Barnard to um, work the door here, and instead of instead of working the door here, she sent me. And Ed Friedman noticed me sitting there, and I maybe while filling out my ex-wife's, uh, as it turns out, um, payment form for whatever, said. Would, we have an opening, would you like to do this thing? And I applied and got the job, and they, they paid $400 an issue, uh, which was, um, you don't, you don't wanna know <laughs> how much I was making at, at Teachers and Writers at the time, but it made a big difference. Um, so I'm gonna read some uh, things that I just randomly remembered about all of that. A community, like it or not, elders, peers, up-and-comers, fawning and irreverent, a selective view of history, celebrity in obscurity, gossip, status, lexical wildness. Bernadette was the only um, truly great poet I ever saw get drunk in an open mic reading and harass a poet. Um, <laughs> She looked up at, at, God bless him, David Cameron, and said, oh, we all really want to hear about your penis. And everyone's like, <laughs> and, and, and bless David's heart, he went right on with it and was fine. Um, but I thought, well, um, it was um, the first thing that I did when I got the job was I said, we have to interview, we have to interview Bernadette. And Ken Jordan um, went and interviewed her, and um, it, you can read it online. One of the things I loved was to find out who would go to bat for whom. One of the things I loved to see was what's new, who's included, and who isn't. The question everybody seemed to be asking was, is the new stuff any good? There's the calendar. There were the donors. There were the ads. But you wanted it to hold together, to read cover to cover. I don't know if you remember magazines. Magazines were great. You would get these things in the mail and you would sit and you would read them until you were like, I hate this, and you'd throw it across the room and you could, and it wouldn't hurt anybody. <laughs> do we do magazines anymore? The internet, uh, there are a couple of things that happened between here and there, and we all know what they are, but I'll just recite them so that we can get it out of the way. One was magazines died, more or less. Um, the internet came and New York City got flooded by money and turned into this. Um, which we're still here. Uh, one of the things that I loved about the early, early issues, and when I got the job, I tried to get my hands on as many of the early issues as I could and read them and, and figure them out. And I'd seen, um, in Kenneth Koch's apartment, I'd seen a bunch of Ron's old issues, and then when I got here, I, I read all of Billy McKay's issues, then I read everybody's issues. And the only thing that I've found that's like that in the, in the years since I left, if you drive if you drive through the middle of the country and you go in these, sm these small town gas stations, they'll sell these local papers with columns about the town. And they'll talk about who's back visiting from where, who's been vacationing in Arizona, what, what the meals are at the, at the local, at the, at the Elks Lodge this week. And it was a little bit like that, but about geniuses making the best art you ever saw. And so, uh, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, sure, I'll do that job. Um, there, was a, there was a quality of just hearing about outlandish personalities at home. Um, I, 
forgot my reading glasses today, so I'm, I'm sort of uh, old. It was, it, was news, it was news from the world we wanted, a little bit the world that we lived in, but a little bit this other thing that we all sort of knew about. There was, a, there was in addition to the, to the impressive roster of institutional uh, uh, newsletters that, that Nick mentioned, there were also Mimeo magazines that were like the newsletter that were in the area. Um, there was the, I, I don't know a lot of them, but I, I, w I saw issues of the 432 Review I saw things that were published around, and, and, and Mag City, um, and, and there was just a spirit of, we're gonna talk about these things, and it wasn't, it, it looked from a distance like clickishness, but I don't think that's what it was. I think it was really just people telling the news. Um, th something that I saw a little bit in the earlier issues that I really loved, um, some edited by Jerome Salas, some edited by, um, Lynn Crawford, uh, was, there was a, a, sometimes you would see something that seemed like it might accidentally be alienating the old guard. And then when I got the job, I, I did that so many times that I thought, well, I might as well start intentionally alienating the old guard. Um, th now, I, you know, I don't know if alienation would work the same way in the age of vibes. I, I don't think you get the same effect. Um, one, one of the things that, that made it possible was that everybody it seemed, was living within a 10 block radius and walking in here and seeing each other, bumping into each other in Tompkins Square Park, bumping into each other in the coffee shop um, in, in Veselka, in Odessa, wherever. Um, and th there was just a, a thing that, that uh, money, money seemed to really want to stamp out or give to other people. The, the real estate and the rent laws and who gets to be a character um, really changed. And poetry was, um, has always been a little bit of a record of, of who's had cheap rent, who's had family money, or both. Um, but I think we see that more and more as fewer and fewer people have cheap rent. There's a comedian whose name I can't find who said, it's easy to live well if you're bad with money I, I was, I, I look at some of the things that I printed and I'm like, we did that? Um, in addition to Ken Jordan's interview, th there, were, there was a portfolio of Rudy Burkhardt's pictures. There was a, a poem by Allen Ginsberg for, for, um, for Carl. There were James Schuyler's journals before they were in a book. I, I went to Bryce Martin's studio and he gave me some slides. I, I, <laughs> I have no idea how this was possible. The, the, one of the things, I, I said I'm gonna recite some of the themes that we all know about. One of the themes is the evaporation of, of free time. It's harder to, to, it's harder to make these things happen without vast reservoirs of complete idleness. Um, and I encourage all of you to find aquifers of it and maybe let me know where they are. What was it like? You know, it was, it was exciting and dumb, really dumb. Uh, and there were these intermittent, great, brilliant moments. I read every issue um, before, before I started um, devotedly and then very sporadically after I stopped editing. <laughs> but you have to let other people have the sandbox at some point, apparently. But there was this Doppler effect of wanting to make something exactly like all the earlier issues and then, after letting go, wanting to change all the issues that came after. Like just, just. But the, the greatest thing that I ever saw um, in the newsletter was on the cover of one of the issues, um, was just the words, Peter Sheldahl on Jerome Sala. And I just thought, oh, <laughs> I have to read that. I'd really like to read that again. When I think about it, most of the real gossip, Jillian, didn't make it in, but how, how, how could it have? There was a feeling that certain of the elders had worked out secret methods to create what Pound called melopoeia, the charged language, and our job was to reverse engineer these methods by hanging out and trying not to be too annoying. I, 
I brought the boards. Well, Ed, when I showed him my first idea for the, um, for the banner at the top, uh, it was in Times New Roman. <laughs> Ed said, I know a designer who will work pro bono, and this will be much better. <laughs> and it was. Um, and I, I printed out these, these boards, these massive, I don't, you, you don't want to hear about it, but, I, but you had to carry large physical objects to meat packing and hand them off. And then later, these big bound bundles of newsprint would show up. And that was the, that was the best. I once saw someone reading a new issue on the one train going uptown. Some writers refused my edits. Some writers called to complain about my typesetting. Some writers told me later they were mad at me for not running a review of their book. I just wanted it to be fun and great and something you could read cover to cover in a Saturday afternoon. So I got the idea doing this afterwards. I could work for magazines. And I, I was uh, set up to talk to a guy who had been working at magazines and who had left to join a private equity firm that was buying up and essentially liquidating magazines. And we didn't hit it off. <laughs> so, so that's the other subject is, is, is no money, free time, magazines, the internet. So the internet. What do we do about it? We write like we're running for our lives. Larry Fagan said when I told him I paid $795 for a studio on 7th Street, my God, no wonder you work like a stevedore. There are poets, and you need both, and they've always been both here and the whole story of this place is a um, charming arm wrestling match. There are poets who want to make an impact, and there are poets who want the party to keep going. Thank you. Oh my goodness. Uh, Jordan, that was so beautiful. Um, thank you all. This uh, concludes our evening. Thank you once again to the readers. Thank you to the volunteers um, and uh, everyone who, all of our production team. Um, before you guys go, even if you get a copy, please take a copy. There's copies on the chairs. We have a bunch more. Take some to give to your friends. We have like a gazillion. Um, and finally, before you all get up and start wrestling, I, uh, it's my great pleasure to invite everyone to our 49th annual New Year's Day Marathon. It's going to be in person for the first time since lockdown. It's going to be in person entirely in this room, January 1st, 2023. Um, it'll be such a sheer joy to see you again on that date. Um, so um, thank you once again for coming. Thank you to everyone who helped make this event happen. Have a wonderful night.